today we're going to talk about American foreign policy in the Gilded Age. Uh, so if you'd like to follow along, just download the PowerPoint, American Foreign Policy in the Gilded Age and Spanish-American War. Okay, so um, if you look at America in the 1870s, the 1880s, America is not a dominant player on the world stage. Uh, the, America had just come out of the Civil War. Uh, there's a lot of internal issues going on. So America is not looking to play a role uh, in international affairs. If you fast forward to 1900, the early 1900s, America is all of a sudden a great power. How did this happen? That's kind of what we're going to try to try to answer today as we talk about foreign policy um, during the Gilded Age. Okay, so American imperialism. Traditionally, America had played a small role in world affairs. Um, why is this? There's lots of, of answers. Uh, the Founding Fathers intended America not to get entangled in other countries' affairs. Geography played a role. America's isolated from Europe. Uh, America had been a small, weak nation up until the 1900s. Um, there's more room out west, so instead of planting colonies overseas, Americans kind of moved the frontier west towards the Pacific Ocean. And America didn't really have a reason to play a role in international affairs. Uh, if you fast forward back to George Washington's farewell address after he'd been president, he said, the great rule of conduct for us in regard to foreign nations is in extending our commercial relations to have with them as little political connection as possible. Europe has a set of primary interests which to us have none. It is our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the poor in world. Uh, Thomas Jefferson said similar things in a series of letters to other Americans. Commerce with all nations, alliance with none, should be our motto. I am for free commerce with all the nations, political connection with none, and little or no diplomatic establishment. Our first and fundamental maxim should be never to entangle ourselves in the broils of Europe. So basically, if you look at the Founding Fathers, they basically said, let's have commercial relations with Europe and the rest of the world. Well, let's stay out of their, their uh, domestic, their internal, their military affairs. Their interests are not the same as ours. Now, uh, prior to the Civil War, America had played had had interactions with other countries, so don't think America is totally shut off from the world. In the 1850s, Commodore Matthew Perry sailed to Japan and forcibly opened up Japan. Uh, during the Civil War, um, the American military grew in power. American diplomacy was tested. The French sent troops to Mexico. Uh, the British built blockade runners for the Confederacy. So there were diplomatic issues that uh, America had to deal with during the Civil War. Uh, after the Civil War, Secretary of State William Seward purchased Alaska from Russia. Um, so there are things going on, but mostly in the, uh, the post-bellum years, the years after the Civil War, America is really focused on industrialization and kind of looks inward. Um, but, but like I said, there's still stuff going on on the international stage. Secretary of State James G. Blaine, he gets involved in a number of, of international ventures. Um, President Chester Arthur begins to build up the American Navy. He, he gives it more ships. A uh, better officer corps starts a naval war college. Um, in the 1870s, America negotiated the rights to coaling stations in the Samoan Islands. In 1895, Grover Cleveland invoked the Monroe Doctrine uh, in a border dispute between Venezuela and uh, the British. Uh, so basically, America is doing little things, but they're mostly focused on their internal affairs. Uh, Thomas F. Bayard, he was the Secretary of State. He said, we have not the slightest share or interest in the small politics and backstage uh, intrigues of Europe. Uh, one of the places that America does get involved with is Hawaii. Um, American interests in the Pacific revolve around around the, the island of Hawaii. Um, there was an early missionary presence in Hawaii. Schools and churches were founded, but probably the main reasons Americans are interested, at least American businessmen, was the sugar cane uh, in Hawaii. Um, many planters go to Hawaii. In 1875, uh, there's a treaty where Hawaiian sugar can be imported into the United States duty-free. That means no taxes. Uh, in 1887, another treaty was signed. America gets naval rights to Pearl Harbor. And in 1890, the McKinley Tariff uh, took away the tax-free status of Hawaiian sugar. That's going to be important here in a minute. 
Um, American planters made a killing off of uh, sugar production in Hawaii. So basically they say if we annexed Hawaii, if we were to annex Hawaii, our sugar would no longer be taxed. So what they do is they organize a revolt against the Queen, Queen Liliokalani in 1893. Um, they attempt to annex Hawaii after they remove her from power, but Grover Cleveland stops them. He doesn't think America should be annexing uh, colonies around the world. Now, Hawaii will get annexed later on uh, during the Spanish-American War by the McKinley administration in 1898. Grover Cleveland said, annexing Hawaii would violate America's honor and morality and tradition against acquiring territories far from the nation's shores. So uh, we do get Hawaii, but that's a little bit later down the road, like I said, in 1898. Now, there are kind of three general causes of imperialism that I've kind of come up with, uh, or other historians have. Economic, military, and social Darwinism, or kind of an ideological reason. We'll kind of go through each of these. Um, the economic argument basically says the United States has a surplus of goods. There's a lot of production going on during the uh, Gilded Age. Too many farmers are producing too much food. Industrialization is happening. America needs a place to sell all of its excess production. <coughs> Senator Al Albert J. Beveridge uh, said, today we are raising more crops than we can consume. Today we are making more than we can use. Therefore, we must find new markets for our produce, new occupation for our capital, new work for our labor. Senator Orville Platt said, a policy of isolation did well enough when we were, were an embryo nation, but today things are different. We are 65 million people, the most advanced and powerful on earth, and regard to our future welfare, and regard to our future welfare demands an abandonment of the doctrine of isolation. So basically a lot of politicians are starting to think, maybe we, maybe we should say goodbye to isolationism, maybe we need to play a bigger role in world affairs. Uh, a really important book during this time was The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. <clears throat> it was written in 1890 by Alfred T. Uh, Mahan. And basically, he argued that since ancient times, many great nations owed their greatness to their powerful navies. So if you look at Greece, Rome, the British Empire, they all had powerful navies. Now, many Americans, especially the Founding Fathers, looked at the oceans that separated America from Asia and Europe and said, these are barriers, these are a blessing because they protect us, they isolate us from all the problems of the world. But Mahan said, the oceans should not be thought of as a barrier, but they should be thought of as a great highway. He called on the United States to build a modern fleet. Um, we would need foreign bases to refuel and resupply our ships. Um, he wanted coaling stations established around the world, but he did not want colonies. So basically, we should we should grab islands in the Pacific uh, for coaling stations and resupply stations, but we shouldn't really mess with the internal affairs. Uh, in 1890, Congress did allocate some funds for three new battleships. Uh, we wanted to get a two-ocean two navy going. Kind of the ideological reason for imperialism is social Darwinism. You know, social Darwinism, kind of life is a constant struggle, only the fittest survive. So you take that idea of survival of the fittest and you apply it to nations, not just animals or people. And the thinking went that Europe was gobbling up the whole world and America won't have any place left. So Europe will have all these coaling stations, all these colonies to sell their goods to, and will be shut out from the rest of the, rest of the world. America will be shut out. And there was this idea that more civilized and advanced nations have a responsibility uh, towards less civilized nations to kind of lift them up. Um, there was kind of this ideology of Anglo-Saxonism, this idea that, you know, England and America were kind of the better races, um, the better people. So it was their job to influence the rest of the world. Um, a philosopher named John Fisk had a lecture he called Manifest Destiny. He said, the work which the English race begun when it colonized North America is destined to go on until every land on the Earth's surface that is not already the seat of an old civilization shall become English in its language, in its religion, in its political habits, and to, and to a predominant extent in the blood of its people. Um, and you had this idea at home of manifest destiny. You know, Americans had always looked west 
towards uh, the Pacific Ocean. Now, the American frontier technically comes to an end in 1890. Um, that's when the government declares the frontier is closed. Uh, it had always served as a safety valve. If you live in a big city, New York, Philadelphia, somewhere in the east, and you can't quite make it, you don't have a job, you could, have, in the past, you could always look to traveling out west. That's over. Uh, Frederick Jackson Turner, who was a very influential historian, he wrote something called The Significance of the Frontier in American History. He basically pointed out that there's a link between the end of the frontier and the beginning of American overseas expansion. Uh, he said, he would be a rash prophet who should assert that the expansive character of American life has now entirely ceased. Moment, uh, movement has been its dominant fact, and unless this training has no effect upon a people, the American energy will continue continually demand a wider field for its exercise. So just because the frontier is over doesn't mean we're not traveling other places. Uh, basically, the safety valve will be overseas now, not the frontier. Now, the biggest event in the Gilded Age involving American foreign policy was the Spanish-American War. Um, if you look at the map on slide 18, you can kind of see how the Spanish Empire in the 1500s, kind of the peak of its reign, controlled a lot of land. But then if you look at it in the 1800s, it really only has a few places left, mainly Cuba and the Philippines. Um, and America had always kind of had a desire to have Cuba be a part of the United States. Um, uh, John Quincy Adams said, if an apple severed, from a temp severed by a tempest from its native tree cannot choose to fall, but to fall to the ground, Cuba forcibly disjoined from Spain can gravitate only towards the North American Union. Um, now, what caused the Spanish-American War? Well, actually, Cuba was ruled by Spain, and the Cubans rebelled often against Spain. In the 1860s, there was something called the Ten Years' War, where uh, General Maximo Gomez led the Cuban rebels against Spanish rule. Uh, that failed. In 1895, Jose Marti, another Cuban rebel, tried to overthrow the, Sp the Spanish rule. Um, he was also helped by Gomez. Uh, Marti is killed in 1895, but the rebellion continues. Um, basically, the Cuban rebels knew that the best way to hurt the Spanish was to destroy sugarcane plantations. Uh, but many American planters have plantations in Cuba, so the American planters kind of get caught in the crosshairs. Um, Spain responded by sending this really cruel general, uh, General Valier, uh, Valeriano Weiler, excuse me, uh, he was sent to Cuba to crush the rebels. He deprived them of food, recruits. Uh, he put them in reconcentration camps, kind of cleared the countryside and concentrated the population where he could keep an eye on them. While the Cubans and the Spanish are fighting, American property is destroyed. American sugar production is disrupted. Um, and, and the American government also realizes that chaos in Cuba might invite European powers to uh, to come and intervene and one thing American the American government doesn't like is Europe messing around in the Caribbean that's kind of considered America's backyard um, and Americans typically sided with the Cubans um, you know the Cubans are fighting a, a monarchy a European power that kind of reminded the Americans of, of their own struggles in the American Revolution and the the uh, the newspapers, the media in America really play this up. Uh, this is something called yellow press. Um, basically, newspapers tell tell really sensational stories to sell newspapers. The best examples of this are Joseph Pulitzer with the New York World and William Randolph Hearst with the New York Journal. Basically, they play up Spanish atrocities. They always paint the Cuban rebels in a, in a positive light. And basically, they kind of compare the Cuban rebels to the American founding fathers. Um, Richard Harding Davis is a really famous journalist, maybe one of the most famous journalists during the Gilded Age in the early 1900s. Um, he writes a story about a Cuban rebel being, a, being shot before a firing squad. I want to read it to you real quick. So a Cuban is lined up. He's about to get executed by a Spanish firing squad. And this is what Harding Davis says. The officer of the firing squad whipped up his sword. The men leveled their rifles. The sword dropped and the men fired. The Cuban sank on his side without a struggle or sound and did not move again. 
At that moment, the sun shot up suddenly from behind them, and the whole world seemed to wake to welcome to the day. But the figure of the young Cuban was asleep in the wet grass, his arms still tightly bound behind him, and the blood from his breast sinking into the soil that he had tried to free. So if you read this stuff, you're probably going to side with the Cuban rebels, not the Spanish uh, tyrants. There's also stories in the newspapers about American ships or sailing to Cuba or Americans on other ships sailing to Cuba. And the, the Spanish search these ships. There are stories about the Spanish making American women take off all their clothes so they can strip search them to make sure they're not taking messages to the Cuban rebels. So kind of seen as a attacking America's honor. Now, William McKinley is president, and he had been in the Civil War. He'd actually served in the Civil War. He said, I've been through one war. I've seen the body stacked like cordwood, and I don't want to go through that sort of thing again. But Teddy Roosevelt, who was Assistant Secretary of the Navy um, and later Vice President, he had a totally different view. He said, I should welcome almost any war, for I think this country needs one. If we lose our, our virile, manly qualities and sink into a nation of mere hucksters, then we shall indeed reach a condition worse than that of the ancient civilizations in, their, in the years of their decay. So you kind of have the old generation wanting to avoid war and the young generation kind of hoping a war happens. Um, McKinley wanted to stay out of the war, but he does tell Spain that they need to stop being so cruel to the Cubans. He orders the USS Maine to Havana Harbor in January of 1898 to protect American interests. Um, later on in February, there's a private letter that gets published by William Randolph Hearst. It, it was from Enrique Dupe de Lome. He was a Spanish official. And he basically says McKinley is a weak president. It really insulted him as a leader. Um, William Randolph Hearst publishes this letter and calls it, the title of this article is the worst insult to the United States in its history. Um, the kind of, I guess, spark that could, or the, the spark that lit the fire, the USS Maine explodes in Havana Harbor in February, 1898. Over 250 American sailors are killed. McKinley orders an investigation, and this this commission determines that a mine blew up the main. Now, we're not at war yet with Spain, so Spain is supposed to keep order in the harbor. They're supposed to protect all the international countries there, uh, their shipping. So basically, Spain, even if they didn't blow the main up themselves, it's kind of their fault, America sees, because they didn't keep the harbor safe. Um, another kind of, I guess, story that gets circulated, uh, Senator Redfield Proctor, he was a friend of William McKinley. He goes to Cuba to kind of see what's happening. He comes back and testifies. He said, I went to Cuba with a strong conviction that the picture had been overdrawn. What I saw, I cannot tell you so that others can see it. To me, the strongest appeal is not the loss of the main but the spectacle of a million and a half people struggling for deliverance from the worst government of which I had ever knowledge, of which I ever had knowledge. He basically sees these reconcentration camps and some of the pictures uh, show, you know, really skinny bodies, people starved to death. It's a pretty bad situation. Uh, war fever grips the nation. McKinley asks Congress for a declaration of war in April. Later on in April, Congress passes a resolution declaring war. They do pass something called the Teller Amendment. They basically say the U.S. has no interest in annexing Cuba. We just want to help them gain their independence, and then we're out of the picture. Um, 200,000 men enlist to join the military to go fight the Spanish. Now, what's interesting is the first battle doesn't take place in Cuba. It takes place in the Philippines. Um, the, the Filipinos had also been rebelling against the Spanish, uh, Spanish rulers. Uh, Emil Aguinaldo was the Filipino uh, nationalist leader there. Um, while the, the Spanish-American War was kind of starting to get going, Teddy Roosevelt, he sent word to Commodore Dewey, who was, had his fleet in Asia. Um, he told them to be ready to intervene in the Philippines against the Spanish if war broke out. Well, when war breaks out, Commodore Dewey moves against the Spanish in the Philippines. You have the Battle of Manila Bay in May of 1898. 
the American Navy defeats the Spanish Navy, no Americans are killed, um, 15,000 American troops land in August, the Spanish surrender to the Americans, not to the Filipinos. So once America gets involved, they kind of take charge of the war. They kind of push the Filipino and the Cuban rebels to the background. Um, so after the victory in the Philippines, uh, Americans invade Cuba. Um, they land in June of 1898. They capture Guantanamo Bay. They storm Santiago. Teddy Roosevelt and his Rough Riders are there. Teddy Roosevelt resigned as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and he joins the military. Um, his group is known as the Rough Riders. They go down there um, at the Battle of San Juan Hill. That's kind of the battle that made them famous. Um, the Rough Riders and African-American units storm San Juan Hill. Um, the Spanish Navy tries to escape out of the harbor, but they're defeated on July 3rd. And basically, Spain surrenders Cuba. There's an armistice signed with Spain. Uh, Spain liberates Cuba. They give them their, their freedom. Uh, Spain cedes Puerto Rico and Guam to the United States, um, and American forces occupy Manila, the capital of the Philippines, until a peace treaty can be worked out with Spain. Uh, Secretary of John Hay called this the splendid little war. Uh, there's less than 400 deaths in battle. Um, over 2,000 Americans did die from sickness and disease, so way more soldiers die from that than from actually fighting. In December of 1898, you have the Treaty of Paris, so America and Spain sign a peace treaty. Um, it's kind of an interesting war. After the Americans defeat the Spanish on Cuba, the American Navy actually voluntarily takes the Spanish soldiers back to Spain. So it's kind of like, yeah, you know, we beat you, now let's we'll take you home, kind of no hard feelings. Um, in the Treaty of Paris, Spain gives up Cuba, Puerto Rico, Guam officially. They sell the Philippines to the United States for $20 million. Uh, this is ratified uh, in the Senate in February of 1899, but it's only by one vote. Um, so Cuba, Puerto Rico, those are kind of two territories that the United States now controls. Uh, the United States doesn't withdraw from Cuba until 1908. Uh, before the American military withdrew, uh, they fixed Cuba's financial system. They drained swamps. Um, uh, they eliminated yellow fever from Cuba. So America really builds up Cuba's infrastructure, tries to help civilize the nation, as a lot of uh, imperialists believe they should do. Uh, Congress had Cuba add the Platt Amendment to their constitution. Basically, the Platt Amendment said the United States has the right to intervene in Cuba if their independence is threatened or if order breaks down. So it's kind of a back door for the United States to get involved in Cuban affairs if they deem it necessary. Um, Cuba also leases Guantanamo Bay to the United States. To the United States, uh, Puerto Rico is under U.S. military rule. In 1900, something called the Foraker Act is passed. It established a civil government for Puerto Rico. Uh, later on, the Jones Shafroth Act uh, in 1917 is passed. It gives Puerto Ricans U.S. citizenship. Uh, but the big prize from the, the Spanish-American Wars is the Philippines. So what should America do with the Philippines? Um, that, that, there's a big debate in the United States over that. Um, President McKinley said, we could not give the Philippines back to Spain. That would be cowardly and dishonorable. Americans must take them all and educate the Filipinos and uplift and civilize them. So basically that idea of we've got the Philippines, it's our job to show them how to be a civilized nation. A lot of Americans oppose this. You had something called the Anti-Imperialist League uh, founded in 1898. They argue that imperialism is a crime and open disloyalty to the distinctive principles of our government. So, so getting overseas colonies goes against American values, kind of like the founders laid out. Um, Andrew Carnegie was a member of the Anti-Imperialist League. He offered to buy the Philippines for $20 million and then grant them their independence. Now, the Filipinos, when they actually fought with the Americans against the Spanish, they, they were supported by the Americans. But when the Spanish are defeated, they expect their independence. They don't get it. So they, they start an insurrection. Uh, Emilio Aguinaldo leads this insurrection. Um, so from 1899 to 1902, that's the biggest war, not the Spanish-American War. It's the Filipino insurrection. 
5,000 Americans are killed, somewhere around 200,000 Filipinos are killed. Um, so this is a way bigger, bloodier battle uh, than, than fighting Spain. It's kind of the Vietnam of the 1800s for America. Um, eventually, Aguinaldo is captured in 1901. Um, about 100,000 troops were in the Philippines and it cost around $400 million. So a very expensive, bloody war. Um, many Americans opposed it. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, always, it's always debated. Um, William Howard Taft, he's going to be a future president. He's sent to the Philippines as governor in 1901. Um, he really cracks down on the, on the insurrection. Uh, he censors the press. You couldn't say negative things about America. Uh, he jailed dissidents. Um, but he did extend self-government. He did build schools, roads and, roads and bridges. His goal is to end the insurrection and then get them on their feet so America can get out of there. Um, in 1916, the United States passed the Jones Act, which basically said someday the Philippines will get independence. And in World War II, as we'll see later, the United States and the Philippines fought with each other against Japan. And then after Japan was defeated, America gave the Philippines its independence. So that's a little bit about American imperialism during the uh, Gilded Age.